I'm going to let Carol Arney, uh, who's on our committee, introduce our main speaker. Carol? Thank you. I'm very happy to introduce Joe. As you saw in the previous slide, building coalitions with other climate activist organizations is one of our key campaigns, and MNIPL is one of those. If anybody doesn't know, MNIPL is an interfaith community co-creating a just and sustainable world. Their mission statement is that we work to build interfaith climate movement in Minnesota by empowering faith communities across the state to take action that is authentic, effective, and energizing in their context. That's why we reached out to MNIPL for a speaker on line three, because they have been um, very visibly active in the line three resistance. And Joe is um, the re pipeline resistance coordinator for the stop line three work of MNIPL. He spent much of his time with frontline resistance e effort. I don't know, Joe, if these are your pictures that you took that you shared with us, but they look exciting. A little bit of fun facts. Uh, he comes from Western, southwestern Wisconsin. He's a graduate of the University of Minnesota, and he lives in Minneapolis. And with that, I'd like to introduce Joe Meinholz. Hey, y'all. Really grateful to be here. Grateful for the invitation. Uh, to share the space. Yeah, uh, I wish I was a photographer that skilled to take those pictures, but I was there both those days and can share some stories uh, from the front lines uh, and introduce you all to the Line 3 Pipeline movement and how you can be involved. And then also looking forward after that to, uh, to hearing from uh, another chapter member about you know oil and gas transport and some of the complex issues at hand. So I hope we can give time for conversation as well. Um, but I will do some slides so, uh, so we're all on the same page about what is Line 3 and the basics. So let me share my screen here. Yeah, so Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, we're building a climate justice movement uh, in faith communities. So I come from the Christian tradition. People come on, on our staff and, and among our volunteers from so many different spiritual traditions, Muslim, Jewish, uh, Buddhist, and many more. Uh, and we believe those traditions hold something for us and how we respond to the climate crisis. Um, and maybe some of you have your own stories with how your traditions interact with dealing with this, this global moment. Um, so this is kind of 20 minutes, uh, it'll fly. Um, what is line three? Why climate justice? Like how does those two words fit together and, and how does line three teach us about those two words? Uh, and then taking action and time to discuss. Uh, I'll do this. So one of the um, ways I wanted to start out uh, is with these questions and hopefully they're resonant questions for you to reflect on uh, and put some answers in the chat, maybe a, a word or phrase that's sticking out to you as you ask these questions. What do you act to protect? And what are some examples of your people or your tradition standing up to oppression or, or to protect what is sacred? So as I'm calling in, I'm calling in from Minneapolis where I live. Um, perhaps halfway through, you'll hear my roommate singing uh, loudly. I live in this Christian uh, intentional community. So we're, he's right on the other side of the wall and he's got his thing. So hopefully that's not distracting. But calling from Minneapolis and calling on uh, Dakota land. And um, that's important because that's the history that we're living in and want to acknowledge that that's the land we're on, that this land was originally and contemporarily stewarded and, and um, lived in by uh, indigenous peoples who through genocide and forced removal um, was the founding of the state of Minnesota. And so when we bring our traditions, our many traditions into this conversation of what is line three, we also wanna bring in the fact that uh, we're coming into a, a land that is stewarded by indigenous people. Um, and those stories, we are, are, are part of us and part of how we have to act uh, now to move forward. Um, so yeah, uh, what do you act to protect? What are some examples of your people and your tradition standing up to protect what is sacred? Love to hey, see Duncan something. Duncan said that he protects the future. Yeah, I, I mean, in my personal life, I, I try to plant plants that are native plants as much as possible. 
Yeah, okay. I mean, I, but I know the bigger things too. I'm being part of this group. Nature, future generation, says Tim. Mm -hmm. And this is Brick. I would say that the the inherent right to be able to connect with nature is important too. I, I think it's important that we realize that we are part of nature. We're, we don't have dominion over nature, that we are actually just a partner in, uh, in the natural world. And we have to behave as such, which we haven't. Yeah, thanks for saying that, Linda, and seeing, and seeing Toya in the chat say the land and um, my father being from Colombia, the condors and the water that used to run pure under Mexico City. Mm, yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'd love to know more about that story, maybe at a different time. Future generations, Minnesota water, sacred water. So these are the places and, and, uh, and the uh, people and the creatures we wanna protect uh, and hope to hold that in our heart as we talk about the facts and this complicated issue. So let's um, move into what is line three. So um, there's a lot of great media out about line three right now. And uh, especially as it's halfway through construction and we're seven years into the debate over the line three pipeline in Minnesota, a lot of these facts maybe you've heard, uh, so I will move through, but also wanna make room for questions. So as you have questions, throw them in the chat and hopefully we can get to them towards the end. So basically uh, this map shows a lot of, of what's at stake. Uh, the Line 3 pipeline uh, is coming from Alberta, Canada and the production of the tar sands oil and then moving that oil to Superior, Wisconsin to be uh, moved abroad and as well as through other networks um, to supply oil products. And the black is where you see bodies of water um, that are directly threatened by oil spills from the line um, and then gray and then moving out to blue. Um, and so you, uh, I'll have a more detailed map next here to see uh, more of the boundaries. So big oil transportation system and you can see in the upper left, that's Alberta, Canada. Tar sands is the dirtiest oil in the world. Um, and the reason we say that is that um, it is being built um, the, the process of extraction, right, isn't plugging a hole in the ground. It's, it's tearing up boreal forest, an area about the size of Florida. You can see it from space. And that destruction um, then uh, turns this sort of uh, sludge into, I mean, just, just as it sounds, tar sands. Um, and the, the, the cost to produce it uh, and extract it is the highest in the world and has the highest carbon impact of anywhere in the world. I believe you can talk about one or two other places in the Amazon. Um, so that's the tar sands and they need to get it to the ocean. And so different pipelines you've heard of, Keystone, Trans Mountain, uh, those are, that pipeline is, is the same oil product, same size and uh, same destination of the products si or similar as line three. And so all of this movement around Keystone we're looking at a similar pipeline with similar climate impacts as Keystone here in line three. Now Enbridge, the company proposing the pipeline uh, spent millions, millions, both in lobbying and in PR. So how many of you raise your hand have seen an Enbridge ad somewhere on your social media, on your internet, uh, in the newspaper? Um, and so the first thing you'll see there probably is the line through replacement project. Um, and we want to be very clear as a movement that's opposing it to say that that's a misnomer because uh, there is a line called line three. Um, but when they say replacement, what they're hiding is the fact that they're more than doubling the capacity of the line and they are moving it to a new route. So you see the old route in orange and the new route in green. So as far as the Minnesota portion, it's a very new route. And these are brand new waters, uh, pristine places that they're opening up to the risk of oil spills. So this is Alberta, Canada before the tar sands. This is a 1980s photo from the air. This is what it looks like now. And when line three gets built, if line three gets built, cross your fingers, uh, that uh, they will be able to expand this industry by so between 10 and 12% of the land base that they're extracting. Now this industry uh, you've probably seen in the news, and let me just back up, this industry is dying. Um, because it's such expensive oil and the world is moving off of oil, this industry is dying. But Enbridge is trying to get profits out of the last 
dying breaths of this industry by building their pipeline and Minnesotans take on the risk uh, while the, the company walks away with their profits um, from building the transportation. Because the way the financing works is that like even if this is a stranded asset in 10 years, they're gonna, they're gonna make their money on the pipeline transportation and we're gonna have a, a, a pipeline left over. And it's very likely that it becomes a stranded asset in 10 years and, and maybe we can have a conversation with, with others who are knowledgeable here about how fast we're moving off the tar sands. Uh, the inevitable end is we're moving off this industry and, and, and thank God because this is what humanity is doing to our planet because of our addiction to oil. So this, the center of this fight uh, is about uh, indigenous sovereignty. So in that oil transportation picture and these technical challenges of climate change, there's also a very spiritual connection um, and a historic connection to the land that Anishinaabe people carry. And this is a picture of wild rice harvesting. Wild rice, this is the only place it grows in the world and Anishinaabe people have a, 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 an inherent right to the wild rice through treaties with the US government. And they also have a, a, a mandate from creator to care for this place. And that's what their tradition says. Uh, and that's the reason that they've risen up and, and taken leadership in this movement to stop line three. Um, Y'all climate reality, care about climate impacts. 50 coal fired power plants, essentially zeroing out uh, any gains we make from clean cars. And um, like if we, if we zeroed out um, transportation and agriculture totally in Minnesota in terms of carbon emissions, line three would still blow through the ceiling. Um, as you can see in this chart, I can send this in a follow-up email if you wanna look more into the, the data. And so I, we asked this question, why climate justice? Because um, as climate activists, you know, maybe you're familiar with why we need to act on climate change, but Minnesota Interfaith Power and Light, we're working on climate justice. And we combine those words uh, for a couple reasons and line three teaches us about, we believe that like moving away from an economy and a culture of extraction um, is linked to the, the struggle for justice. And, and justice means a lot of things, um, but particularly uh, racial justice and justice for indigenous people is coming to the forefront in line three. So the US government, you know, climate change might be a new story to us, right? Like the last 20 years since Al Gore made a documentary, we all care about this, right? For indigenous people on line three, they're seeing this pipeline as a very old story, right? It's the story of colonizing. It's the story of their rights being trampled and their lands being sacrificed and their people being moved uh, or, or oppressed uh, to benefit and profit um, uh, colonial governments and, and colonial corporations. And, and so um, this is one of the most troubling parts of line three I, on this slide, you can see the same violence that we're seeing against communities of color in the cities um, and, and the, I mean, across the country and what we've, uh, been reckoning with in our country for so long is the same uh, police violence that is actually being wielded now against indigenous water protectors in Northern Minnesota. So the company is in effect paying for law enforcement, Minnesota law enforcement, and that includes the Department of Natural Resources. So I've been at protests multiple times, both in Minneapolis and up North where the Department of Natural Resources come out in riot gear to stop protest streams who are there to protect the water, who are there to protect their lives. And the irony of that image in itself shows us that the sickness is deeper than just, just a technical problem of carbon emissions. It's a spiritual and cultural problem of violence. Um, and that is directed against indigenous people. Um, and meanwhile, uh, this is a great graphic from Honor the Earth, which is an indigenous organization. 80% of the biodiversity left on planet earth is on indigenous land. And so the places that we need to protect are also the places that are stewarded by people who are most vulnerable to cultural extinction. So we stand up for treaty rights. And if we stand up for treaty rights and stand with our indigenous neighbors um, as, as many Minnesotans from many backgrounds, maybe we can, I, I believe we can cut through to some of the answers we need to live, have a livable future. And so this is that same picture was shared earlier, indigenous folks leading the way in a healing ceremony to stand in the way of construction. 
uh, how am I doing on time? Um, I'd love to get to how y'all can act. You're fine. You're fine, Joe. Keep going. This is a, a subject that everybody's interested in. So, yeah, great. Um, yeah, maybe let's let's pause for a second for questions and mm -hmm. and then for for maybe a couple minutes, throw a couple in the chat uh, on the what is line three, and then we'll get into what we can do to to stop it and stand. Hey, hey Joe, can you get, can you give a legislative update at all on where where uh... Courts in and, and um, is, there, yeah. are things, is things full steam ahead? Is there anything, any hope of, of this being delayed or, or stopped? Yep, yep, yep. Here we go. I got a slide. Yeah, and keep the keep the questions coming in the chat. Okay, I have a question. I have a question on the new pipeline. It looks like it's going around the reservations except Fond du Lac, and I and that's new to go through Fond du Lac. And I was just wondering, is that a ge geological thing or? Or what? Yeah, yeah. I'll start with your question, Linda, and then and then uh, get to the legislative. The uh, good good catch on the tribal lands, and so I'll, I'll go back to that side. Um, oh, it won't let me back up. Um, I'll just say it out loud. So, number of tribes in Minnesota, uh, Fond du Lac approved the project, and Enbridge um, had sort of a. a a strategy from the beginning to divide and conquer uh, <laughs> in Minnesota. And part of that was buying out tribes and seeing who would take uh, the deal. So it was a very painful decision and a very complicated one that I could send some more writing on. But Fond du Lac essentially um, uh, approved it and, uh, for the tax base that it provides and uh, for the promises that Enbridge made to clean up their old line. Uh, Leech Lake, which you could see was avoided with the pipeline. Um, was a part of approving the project essentially through a Sophie's Choice where, where the company said, which lake would you like it to go by? And instead of going by um, putting, a, putting a new sacred lake, lake under threat, um, that, that um, I wish I knew the name um, off the top of my head, but I don't want to speak about it. Um, th they essentially chose to go with the lesser of, of two risks as far as sacred places to them. Um, and so those two tribes were part of approving it in slightly different ways. And then White Earth, Red Lake are uh, currently in court as tribal entities to stop the pipeline, both at a state level and a national level. Um, and then tribal members from across uh, Minnesota have, have stood against it. There's tribal members working on the project. So it's, it's not a clear cut narrative um, and it gets into the complexities of tribal law, but that's generally the answer on, on Fond du Lac. Thank you. Yeah. So let me let me get into this slide a little bit. Um, so you've maybe had a chance to read it. Um, they started construction in December. The Walls administration made promises about treaty rights and consulting indigenous uh, tribes. And then with two tribes in court to stop it, he approved all the permits. Um, so they're starting at breakneck speed because they know that there is a protest movement rising to stop it. And so they uh, have been stopping at nothing to build this pipeline. And there was already one worker who's died on the job uh, from an accident at how fast they were moving. And they paused work for three hours and kept moving. Um, there's, it's a very dangerous situation as, as the company tries to build. And they are at about 50% right now. Um, so a lot of pipe is already in the ground. One of the key places of re resistance is the fact that this, this, this uh, pipeline drills under the headwaters of the Mississippi twice. So first in right by Itasca State Park, if, if you know where that is, uh, east of the White Earth Reservation. Um, it goes only about 10 miles from the start of the Mississippi River, they're, they're ready to drill. And they're also ready to drill uh, in Palisade, Minnesota, directly north of the cities, uh, under the Mississippi again. 220 bodies it crosses and hundreds of wild rice lakes. That drilling can't happen until uh, the end of the mud season. And so that those drilling sites um, are places where people, you know, it, it's very symbolic, right? Like there's a, there's a need to stop it before that sort of destruction happens. Do you, do you have an opinion on why Walt, Walt did that? 
was that a, I mean, must be some kind of political pressure, but it just seems so diabolical. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've struggled to give a good answer to this for a long time because we fought so hard to have him uh, make uh, a choice against the pipeline. I mean, it came down to, to union jobs, I think in a big way, but also his calculation that, that it was only radical environmentalists who care about something like this because the mainstream environmental movement cares about other things, which I think is a uniquely stinging disappointment to some of us working on it because when you look at 50 coal-fired power plants, like this is what's happening uh, in climate, in the climate crisis in Minnesota. Um, and of course, there's lots of other good work going on in the environmental movement. I don't want to diminish that. Uh, could you, uh, what does um, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan think of it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, she has sp spoken publicly against the pipeline before she was in office as Lieutenant Governor. Um, her stance has not been as strong since being in office and um, yeah, so, so, basically, it's it, it used for political power to, to oppose it. I also read, um, over the weekend that, um, their tax courts ruled that there was a significant overvaluation of the pipeline and all these great, you know, supposed tax revenues that were going to go into these communities now have to be refunded by these communities that they cannot afford to pay back. So, I mean, it's, it's gonna create this secondary ripple economic impact that's the exact opposite of what they had hoped to have happen from a, uh, from a revenue standpoint. Is that, is that accurate? Yep, yep. And I mean, the, the mistake there comes both from the company and from the government uh, miscalculating tax revenue, but Enbridge is, is fighting pretty hard to get every last cent out of those counties that they can. And that's a pretty villainous thing to do when their PR campaign is based on helping Northern Minnesota communities. I mean, it's tens of millions of dollars. I mean, it, yeah, it, they'll bankrupt plenty of counties up there through that. You know, I reached out to the Eternal, attorney general's office at Keith Ellison and talked to one of his people. And I said, what is Keith doing about this? This is social justice, racial, this is indigenous people. And I got the guy kind of excited, but I never heard anything more from Keith Ellison, but he is our attorney general. He's supposed to be fighting for us, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's also passed up opportunities to stand against the project in a stronger way. But I will note the, the third bullet point here um, that the, uh, Crazy, one of the crazier parts of this whole thing is in addition to the tribes fighting in court in the Sierra Club, Honor the Earth, right, the environmental groups, Minnesota Department of Commerce is fighting to stop the project in court currently. And their argument is that it's an, not an economic boom for Minnesota. It's a stranded asset and it should never have been proposed and built. So they are, it's a, it's a Minnesota state agency fighting another Minnesota state agency. And Attorney General Keith Ellison could use a lot of calls to say, you know, keep pushing this court case and make sure it gets through because we asked, the, those parties asked to stop construction while this happens. And as you can see, June 21st is when we get an answer on whether or not the Department of Commerce can stop the project, but it will be over 50% built by then. And so it, it's, it's, it's them ramming it through um, at, at breakneck speed and corporations basically buying out our, our Minnesota government, the MPCA, the Public Utilities Commission and the Par Department of Commerce has been one to stand in the way. So let me just go quickly through how, what are the avenues? And because a lot of you are asking about um, uh, like who are, the, who are the political movers and how we stop it. So what do we do to stop line three? Um, I'll start at the bottom. So the company backs out. There's a, there's a movement called Defund Line Three and it is now reaching international attention. And that is the movement to take your money out of banks that finance the project. Did anyone partake in that around the Dakota Access Pipeline in 2016? Defund Apple. Um, I think that yeah. was pretty powerful. Yeah, people are showing up at banks across the world. Chase Bank, uh, 
Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo. To finance the project and they're getting that insurance moved out. So that's one way that we can stop it is, is that pillar of their financial support is weakening and shaking. And uh, we keep that, that pressure, the tar sands falls apart. Secondly, the courts can stop the project June 21st. That would stop it in its tracks. Uh, and there's a very solid court case there. Um, third, Biden can stop the project unilaterally. He can do uh, that through a number of routes, but basically he, Trump rushed the environmental review at the national level and approved it in December. And so Biden could reverse that and say, we want a longer environmental review that would kick it back to courts. There are letters being written to Biden. I wrote one yesterday from one of these organizations. It might've been the Sierra Club. I can't even remember. There's so many call it, you know, contacting me, but I wrote a letter to Biden. I think that that's probably a, a good thing to do is to put more pressure on the White House. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and these last two, direct action and mass movement are exactly about that. So that in addition to calling and emailing, indigenous leaders are asking people to come and stand in the way of construction. And when we build a mass movement on the ground, we create the conditions for the Biden administration to listen and to have to listen to the power of people rising up. And when we say direct action, we mean uh, there, there are over 300 people who have been arrested standing in the way. And mm. they are doing everything from standing in the way of machinery to, uh, to exercising prayer and their own, you know, and Native people uh, doing ceremony in the way of construction. And then also people locking to equipment to stop the, the, the uh, project for longer. Um, so there are so many ways to jump in and I'll, I'll take off slides so we can get back to a good conversation. But this is, this was one of the first days of construction on the left, this photo. And this is Don Goodwin, uh, Anishinaabe woman from White Earth, who is praying in the way of that bulldozer. And, you know, she's powerful and courageous. And three months later, this is a march in St. Paul. And that's the kind of courage that you know, that moves us towards stopping something that, you know, we, our choices don't end when the courts say yes, when the government says yes, like we have power as people. And um, so hope you can jump in to, uh, we can help you get north to join the front lines. We can help you get resources to plug in in so many ways um, to support this movement. Um, yeah. So, um, I've noticed that from time to time, MNIPL has, um, a pre-set letter that you, it'll it'll mail merge your name in it into it. Uh, do they have anything going right now on on line three that we can jump onto and then add our own comments? Yeah, yeah. So as far as letters going in, um, the the main ask is to Biden calls and and emails. Uh, you can take action at stopline three dot org, uh, and that is the main place where you can just. Uh, click through. Okay. Um, our next, our short speaker, we always have a chapter member uh, give a short presentation after our guest. And Graham Stock is a chapter member who is trained in 2019 um, and I got a little bit of background that he sent me. He's a, got a civil engineering degree uh, in Mankato and he worked for a couple of years doing construction testing. And he says he actually spent a year with a wind tower project in South Dakota. He then moved to Fairbanks, Alaska where he got his petroleum engineering degree and he wants to be on the front lines attempting to extract hydrocarbons in the safest, most efficient way possible. Graham believes that we need as many people po as possible truly caring about the environment to work on these jobs to minimize spills and waste. Graham, it's all yours. I'm just here to talk with you about, well, like uh, Carol said, the most ethical way to transport oil and gas. So, and I agree with a lot of what Joe has said today. He did a very good job today, I think. Um, I, I want to express how I sincerely think that, you know, they're, you know, the protesters are treated extremely poorly by our governments. And uh, 
just the whole interactions around that are just terrible. Um, I agree that there are certain routing methods that purposely go through poorer communities and ignore the more wealthy communities. Um, I also agree that um, basically uh, tar sands are basically as bad as coal, if not worse, and that we should definitely not be extracting them. Um, so especially when we can far more safely extract oil and frack gas, which has a far lower CO2 uh, emissions relative to that. Um, so, and, and Joe asks, you know, who are my people? You know, really, I don't think I have a people, but if you made me pick, I would say everyone equally. Then again, I have a t-shirt that says, I hate people, and that's probably a little more accurate. Um, I am, however, a huge fan of nature and all wildlife and science. So let's just kind of get on with it here. So I just want to get on the same page. So this is the Climate Reality Project, and let's talk about the reality of our situation. First, we need to stop using hydrocarbons as fast as possible. And B, if we're gonna, we, we're just like 100% addicted to fossil fuels. And if we quit cold turkey tomorrow or anytime before we can phase them out with other energy sources, there would be massive riots, near immediate destabilization of our governments. And most everyone would be dead within a year, probably more. And it, it would be absolutely terrible. Um, we need to make sure that oil spills and natural gas leaks are minimized as much as possible. And we should be transporting oil and gas in the safest way possible for the environment as a whole. And then the last thing, we should extract oil and gas uh, as close to the final destination to minimize transportation. What I mean by that is we should try and produce oil and gas near its you know, final destination rather than extracting on one side of the planet and using it on the other side of the world, you know, when possible at least. So, you know, there's basically four main methods of transporting oil. There's semi-trucks, which are by far the most dangerous and cause the highest CO2 emissions. And then there's tankers, great for hauling across large bodies of water and in most ways the safest. Um, then there's the pipelines and they produce the least CO2 emissions um, relative to any other method. They're the safest method for transporting oil over land. They're able to transport natural gas and they're far more, uh, they're far cheaper than rail and truck. I mean, cheap energy is good for the world in a lot of ways, at least. Um, <laughs> and and you don't think cheap oil is, feel free to interrupt. Okay. Um, and then there's uh, rail, which uses roughly 40% more CO2 relative to pipelines. It's uh, far more frequent accidents and spills, and it's just not scalable to meet our addiction is the biggest thing. As soon as we can get done with oil, that's great, but we need to, we can't stop or else terrible things will happen. So what, we sh what should we do differently? Um, we should support new oil pipelines that replace aging pipelines, um, especially for corrosion reasons when they get far too old. And uh, especially because the newer pipelines generally, um, if engineered correctly, will have far more safety. Um, uh, sorry, uh, just uh, safety things. Um, we need to support the best practices for the manufacture and insulation of the pipeline. So, you know, more check valves, more, sorry, my dog's coming at me here. Um, just, we can do things so much better than what we're doing. We need to be involved to ensure that major pipelines go along the shortest possible route while avoiding major population centers. We need to increase inspections on new and existing pipelines and shut down and replace if necessary. And especially increase remote monitoring systems to stop 
um, oil going through these pipelines if it's, you know, there's a leak. Um, and I'm just going to show just a quick thing. This is our, these are the main pipelines in America. This is absolutely astounding on how much this is. And they're going through every single town, every single house in America mostly has natural gas directed to it. So, you know, there's a lot we need to do to stop that, switch over to electric. And just some, some of the most common ways that uh, the pipelines fail. And just a, a reminder that this is a mountain that we need to overcome. We need this, this top little bit is only, you know, from coming, there's not very much energy coming from solar, wind, hydropower, nuclear. The, the rest is still gas, oil, coal. And until we can provide their world with energy they need to survive, we can't shut it off. Um, just open it up to questions. I, I've got a couple of comments, Graham. Sure. That's all right. Um, yeah, please. You know, I, res I, I respect your, you know, your overview uh, there. It seems to me like the title of your presentation is really a false choice and it's misleading in the use of the word ethical. Um, I know you've kind of danced around in terms of acknowledging that tar sands are bad or natural gas leaks are, you know, bad. Um, uh, you know, the, the pipelines are safer uh, argument just doesn't really cut it when you consider the equivalent of 40 coal plants in the state of Minnesota from line three. Oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. Safe. I'm in, I'm in no way, shape or form supporting line three. I, I get I it. I absolutely but, oppose but, that. But you're, but you're also making this spacious argument about uh, terrible things are going to happen. I mean, you, you said that uh, solar, you know, and, and wind energy, renewable energy aren't really there. You know, in Minnesota, yeah, one point three percent. Yeah, let me tell you. Let me give you another fact. In Minnesota, we're at twenty nine percent renewable energy. We'll be at forty percent by twenty twenty five. That's excluding heating. That's only energy for electricity. Do you right. want us to freeze? It, yeah, there's an example of an argument that's just total bullshit as far as I'm concerned. You ever heard of an electric furnace? Sure. So if everyone goes to electric furnace, then yeah, so now we are... Your argument is always we can't do it because, because we need oil because we can't do it and bad things We will cannot happen. do it tomorrow. Right. As soon as and, we and can that get argument, it, that's great. And that argument of staying on fossil fuels is suicide. It's suicide for our culture. Let me give you another example. Minnesota is gonna warm between five and six degrees Fahrenheit over the next 30 or 40 years. You know what that's gonna do? What is your solution? What are you suggesting we do tomorrow, my, next year? My solution would be to number one, shut down line three. I agree. Okay. <clears throat> number two, shut down DAPL. You can create demand and response in two different ways. You don't have to keep going with something that's bad in order to, uh, you know, uh, justify not doing something or the fact that it's not ready in another area. So would you rather I, us import gas from foreign countries with far lower? I, I mean, we're going to use yeah, it. Yeah. Where is the oil from line three going? Again, you're. Why are they me... putting it? Why are they sending it to ports? You're telling, you're giving me, you're saying that I support line three, and I really do not. No, but the idea is that pipelines can be managed, that, that it's a false choice. How do we get our energy? Our, our, as simple as this, we have to stop burning shit. And I agree. one way to do that is by to eliminate pipelines and to get over this argument that it's safer to move oil in a pipeline than it is by a tanker car. It's just absurd. Uh, if, if I may, uh, I'm curious. So it's, uh, 
I thought that this was a, uh, a pro line three talk for a good chunk. Oh, of I got absolutely that. not. I appreciate that. Um, but I'm curious what, uh, what Joe thinks about other pipelines other than line three, are there situations where, Hey, actually a pipeline in this area is better than running by a train, you know, with the understanding that we should uh, as rapidly as possible be, uh, decreasing our dependence on fossil fuels as possible, the keyword there. <laughs> yeah, thanks Thanks for the question, Eric, and, and thanks for the presentation, Graham. I, I really appreciated it a lot. Um, uh, I think I, I was thinking about a couple things as you present. Um, the, the staggering complexity of moving our society off of fossil fuels is something we're all gonna hold in different ways, and we all have a lot of different roles in. Um, and I love that metaphor of addiction because it really gets to the kind of like, okay, then this is going to be painful to get off. There's going to be some withdrawal, but there's also like a way to care for people off of addiction. Um, so anyway, that's more of a, a philosophical reflection on your specific question, Eric. Um, yeah, I mean, I got a pipeline running under my feet right now to get me heated in the winter. I, I like the realism of that is important to acknowledge so that we do not in our movements villainize something like a pipeline, villainize even the idea of fossil fuel uh, laboring, you know, or, or like all the people that commit to our society. Um, Dakota Access in line three, Keystone, these are all main arteries and these are questions of international, do we have the political will to move away from an industry that we're massively subsidizing and that we're, we are ready to move off of. Uh, in the case of line three, particularly those products benefit the corporation, but we do not rely on line three products. So that transition is happening. And the only thing investing us in that pipeline, what the Minnesota Department of Commerce argues is the only people who wanna stay invested in that are the companies who have money in it and people in Minnesota don't depend on that oil. So that's a line three specific argument, but I, I think Graham brings up a lot of, I mean, even the, the bigger existential question of how we make a just transition, not uh, go cold turkey tomorrow. And, and who's responsible for that transition? All of us, and uh, there's a lot of roles in that transition. So yeah, that's, uh, that's my Joe, thought brief, I Graham. I don't know if you have something there. Oh. What's your understanding of what would happen uh, to the old line three if the new one is blocked? Will it continue in use? What will happen? Yeah, and this, this speaks directly to something Graham said, and Graham, I'd love to hear feedback on this. Uh, uh, the old line three, new line three argument is a really, uh, it's one of the ways that Enbridge scared Minnesota into getting the new pipeline. Um, but what we discovered in the court of law, and you can watch the recording, of the Minnesota Department of Commerce arguing with the judges and the Enbridge lawyers is that actually Enbridge line three, the old one has spilled very little. And because it's, it's not a question of old versus new pipelines. Corrosion is a, is a low, is a low stake in that. It's Incredible. how much we monitor. So actually the old line three, um, they are monitoring it very, very well, but they told the state of Minnesota, you, you need to give us a new pipeline because our old one is leaking terribly. And then when we ask them, well, you're responsible for it leaking, is it leaking? And they're like, no, it's not leaking. So it's uh, testing and monitoring is something that we have weak regulation on and we need to strengthen regulation to hold companies accountable uh, to monitor and whether that's an old pipeline. So uh, with new line three, they plan to abandon in the ground, which is um, a troubling, but uh, also industry best practice. And Graham, maybe you know, know about that. Uh, uh, Joe, on that topic, I was reading a Guardian article a couple of days ago, and they said that the reason that the new line was requested was that the Obama administration in 2014 required them to because of their history of spills. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know quite the most details about that. I've, uh, I've heard of that. Graham, do you have any response, um, any more to add on sort of the risk of oil spills? And um, Not a lot. All I know is that we do need to monitor this more. I agree with that. And a lot of that comes with remote monitoring. So, you know, a person can't be inspecting the entire line. And they need to be adding a lot more sensors to these things to make them more, a lot smarter. 
I guess, is one of the biggest things. Yeah. How do you and, monitor something that's underground? Pressure sensors, mainly, I guess. Um, loss of pressure um, or unexpected losses of pressure yeah. is the biggest thing, or losses in temperature. That is it, folks. And I'm going to stop sharing and uh, get back to um, conversation for anybody that has, wants to continue a dialogue with uh, Joe and or Graham and talk about these issues. Um, I guess I would like to just kind of hop on something that Eric Meyer said. Um, he was saying how these uh, pipelines, especially the gas pipelines, can be repurposed uh, to basically transition ourselves to a uh, zero emissions future. Um, there's been quite a few studies that have shown that you can basically add uh, hydrogen to these pipelines and uh, most appliances um, don't even need to be adjusted or if they do, it's very minor. So what we can do is use these exact same pipelines to provide hydrogen gas as soon as we can start providing enough and building that enough. Um, so that's one very good way to repurpose these, um, these, this infrastructure for the future. Yeah, I had a quick question for both Joe and Grant, I guess. So uh, obviously we're not going off gas tomorrow because uh, yeah, the complications would be massive. But uh, I guess this is more for Graham. Don't you think that we should try tomorrow to get off gas rather than simply saying, um, like recognizing it and then moving past it? Isn't it, isn't it time right now to say these expansions to infrastructure aren't necessary and the, the need that they're filling can be filled with better, more sustainable options and to not cut everything all at once and not abandon fossil fuels, but to you know, stop expanding at the rate we are. Is that, do you think that is a reasonable solution? Um, if the time frame was reasonable, like if, if it was five years um, and we were going to be off, I'd say absolutely. But it's the horizon is just too far out there. Um, we can't stop. It's, it's an addiction. It, it's going to take too long for us to, to stop, I guess, is the biggest thing. Like Isn't the first just, thing in curing addiction though stopping to feeding into that behavior? So what yeah. like transitioning uh, the massive subsidies that the fossil fuel industry receives, transitioning those to more sustainable forms of energy, aren't these oh, things that we uh, could do tomorrow simply to aim for that five years? Um, the five years is simply impossible. Um, but you're absolutely right. Fossil fuel should get le far, far less um, government money. I could uh, um, but, just speak to this for a second. Uh, uh, you know, back in the day, we uh, burned whale oil <laughs> uh, because we didn't have oil coming out of the ground yet. Um, and I think uh, just as now, uh, we we don't quite have the substitute that that we need. You know, we're we're not building electric cars at uh, a high enough rate, and e even if we were, our electricity is still highly dependent on, on fossil fuels. So um, yeah, we got it. We didn't make the switch with whale oil till we had something something different. Even though we knew that it was pretty terrible to just kill these giant mammals in the ocean and and uh, burn their blubber for light. <laughs> um, and same thing now. We know what we're doing hurts the planet and and, and kills people just from air pollution. But uh, until we get a substitute, we're gonna have to keep doing it. Um, Accelerate yeah, I understand that development but deployment. <laughs> yeah. We we certainly could make the substitute more uh, more. We could set it up better for success, in my opinion. Uh, like yes, we aren't going to be able to do this all in a night, but by you know s making these legislative changes now, by stopping to expand the infrastructure, uh, sure the price of energy might increase, but that would encourage other forms, other carbon free nuclear, solar, wind, other ways to get our energy. So I think just like aiming for that with 
understanding the necessity, but then saying we can we can cut back a little to encourage the innovation. Yeah, because we're not going to run out of coal the way we ran out of whales. Yeah, we have to we've got a couple of uh, questions in the chat, and I think that. Uh, both Joe and Graham, if you'd look at the chat, I think there's some yeah. for each of I, I'd be interested in talking about Steve's um, question about algae. Um, it's, we, we also need to think about the, I've heard a couple of my teachers uh, talk about the food, energy, water nexus. Um, algae takes a significant amount of water. I mean, we can't just think about CO2. We're destroying our world in so many other ways. Um, we're extracting groundwater far, far too fast. Um, it's, we're, we're taking money out of the bank that we just don't have. And um, algae takes a very, very high amount of water to do. That being said, we should continue researching it. And uh, there is potential there, lots of potential, but in its current form, um, it's not feasible on a large scale. Um. Hobie asked a little while ago about, you mentioned hydrogen gas could be used in the pipelines. And uh, his question is very simple. Where does the hydrogen gas come from? Um, from, well, when theoretically we start using uh, wind and solar, we need to back up this energy. We, you know, ideally um, wind and solar would be going all day, but it's not. We need to store this energy somehow. Um, and even though it's very inefficient, um, you know, you lose 40 or so percent of the energy you put in, um, you can store hydrogen um, really indefinitely and uh, save that for future use, especially when you got it going during the summer, um, you're getting lots of use. And uh, during the winter, you can take that energy out and uh, pump it through those same pipelines that are going, that have natural gas right now. But that, where is it coming that, from? Where do you what, get, I mean. Uh, water. It, uh, water. Electrolysis. Okay. Um, I, Graham, you, you're, you're blowing my mind a little bit with the, uh, you can use the same pipelines we have now. Because uh, my understanding, you know, because hydrogen, such a small molecule, uh, you have to, one, uh, cool it. And one, it has to be a lot more pressurized uh, to kind of get the, get the volume um, you want and then there's like issues with embrittlement of steel and it can leak out a lot more so i was thinking like uh, if we're going to use hydrogen probably got to do a little bit of chemistry throw a couple like carbon uh atoms on there make a hydrocarbon <laughs> maybe we can you know <laughs> grab them out of the sky a little, you know reprocess that co2 uh, i didn't think you could just mix in hydrogen i, I saw some research that where they're doing uh that in small amounts honestly i'm not the expert on this um you might be right yeah. I, I, can make, I can make a couple comments. The, I, I think the maximum uh, mix you can go is about 15% hydrogen to traditional gases uh, before you start having issues with the embrittlement. Um, the question that I've always asked and never got a, a, an answer from a technologist that I you know, thought knew the answer is <clears throat> if you build a pipeline and it can carry hydrogen gas, can it also transfer fossil fuels, because then, of course, I missed the whole presentation tonight, I'm sorry, but the, um, in a scenario where you just started mandating that all new pipelines have to be built to specifications to carry hydrogen gas, in a sense, you're getting free pipelines built for the future um, with the fossil fuel money of today. That'd be a great idea. This is that would be something you should push for if that's if that is the case. I'm, but, I'm not the full on expert at that. Yeah, but there's more problems in a sense. It, you know, there's three kinds of hydrogen. Um, let's see. I think it's it's black, gray, and green. And you know, it's an indication of where the hydrogen come fr comes from. And green hydrogen. There's purple as well. That's that's. There is a purple. Yeah, yeah gray, <laughs> purple, and green. And you know, the idea behind green is is it it gets um, created as a result of renewable energy. So when you have extra renewable energy, you convert that energy into hydrogen, and then you store the hydrogen and use it as a source of energy somewhere down the road. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to make a comment. Can everyone hear me? Yep. You can. Yeah. Great. So um, I had a, my wife was having a meeting inside the house, so I'd be quiet for most of the time. And <laughs> but I think as we recently experienced the exchange between Hobie and Graham, that it's a contentious topic talking about whether or not uh, we have the capacity to 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 quickly, more quickly stop util utilizing the infrastructure that transports the oil that many of us are using uh, for heat uh, and electricity to light our houses, et cetera. And I think part of how we might move forward from these debates is to really to try to avoid the generalizations that we often use about stopping tomorrow. We know that's not a reality, but what we can do is to prioritize and start <clears throat> um, 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 identifying those assets in the infrastructure that we simply don't need. We don't need line three. We don't need Absolutely. that tar sands oil. Everyone can agree on that because it's not going to go into our cars in Minnesota. Most likely it's not going to hit our homes in Minnesota. It's going to be exported in a pure product. There's already plenty of oil on the earth's surface um, <clears throat> to, to reach over two degrees Celsius, as we know. It's what I think would be very helpful in our dialogue is to start preparing um, information that starts to prioritize and help us make decisions uh, with constructive um, uh, dialogue on how to reduce which of these infrastructures we can street, um, re remove from the sectors sooner than later. So I'd love to see a, a next generation presentation, Graham, where you take what you have right now and you identify those particular types of oil lines and things that we don't absolutely need for a given sector within our communities or, or you know, it'll be based on the state level, I'm sure. Um, different counties will have, have a higher uh, reliance on oil versus others. And so how do we move to those steps so we can avoid the, getting into the arguments about whether or not we need oil and we can stop tomorrow to making um, informed decisions about how we are doing that. We know we're already using uh, renewables in, a, uh, in a many different locations throughout the world. So it's a reality now. It's not a if then like the hydro is. Um, and so I think it'd be great to be able to see new generations of information to help us as a community to make decisions on what we would support in advocacy uh, and be willing to be um, present to protest. Um, I think that'd be very helpful in our dialogue moving forward. And that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thanks. I'd like to throw out that, uh, say the thing does get built and we aren't able to block it. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Let's say it happens. What can we do? And I'm wondering if uh, some version of the carbon tax could be used to make it just enough higher that they, it's, not, it's not worth it right now. I'm just wondering if, if that's been considered. So, I guess I like, thought this group. Close. I thought this group was uh, against a carbon tax. Last I checked. Mm, uh, as a whole. I don't think so. So uh, yeah, I'll jump in again you here. Could uh, call individuals. I don't think that we're all against the carbon I, tax. I agree on an individual level, but as a um, as a group, at the top levels, um, last I heard, we were against a carbon tax. And it was too complicated or some bullshit reason. I think they're taking more of a uh, do things directly to help the people as opposed to having it uh, refunded. I think that's the national uh, approach, but still. Uh, but this, I'm just wondering if we could still do some modified carbon tax that uh, might make it unaffordable for them sooner than later. Well, so the. Um... Tim, I can't remember what we did with the Enroads model. Did you, did you go through that, or did we never pull that off? Oh, we yeah. yeah, we yeah, went that, through that. with uh, I'm forgetting his name too. <laughs> Tim, that was a, that was the most impactful move in terms of accelerating us being able to reduce, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, both emissions and the emissions. Uh, right. temperature. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, the only downside of the. Uh, of moving ahead and actually, you know, a lot of the people that are pushing for it call it a carbon price instead of a carbon tax. You can call that marketing or whatever, I don't know. But um, it, it, the downside is the equity issue. Right. Um, and so, you know, an organization like uh, uh, 
CCL, they, they push really heavy. That's their number one ask of, of the, leg of the mm -hmm. uh, representation. And their, their version of it is a carbon price plus a dividend. So the idea is um, the average person, the person at the low end of the economic spectrum gets a dividend back that pays for the extra costs resulting from the carbon price or tax or whatever you want to call it. And so really the, it ends up being a tax on the rich kind of um, uh, the way they have it architected. I don't know if, you know, back to the point that was just made, um, understanding what levers are going to have the biggest impact is what En-ROADS does. So you know, I don't know if the group wants to um, consider a workshop that that might be a way yeah. for, the, for the larger group to get an understanding what what things can I do? You know, that that's how it helped me. It's like, yeah. Um, Tim, is, is that En-ROADS uh, things on our website? Yeah, there's still a link there. You could go, th you could go through and do it. A lot of us did go through a, a training that was offered a, a few months ago. So, And you can actually go out to the website and uh, register to be in a seminar. I don't think they offer them very often because I don't think a lot of people sign up on the websites. Um, the other option is, you know, I know a bunch of uh, – ambassadors that do the workshop. So if we had a big enough group, we could just do one uh, targeted at this group too. Hey, um, hey, I'm gonna have to log off here, but um, okay. I wanted to just share one event that I forgot to share earlier um, for the case that uh, some of y'all could be there. Um, and then, and then I'm gonna need to log off, but uh, this is, we've sp spoken a lot about uh, addiction and one of the indigenous leaders working on stopping the pipeline, uh, Tanya Abed is starting a fossil fuel addiction treatment center, which, uh, <laughs> it, which, you know, always starts with a laugh and then she, and then she gets serious about it. She's been through her own path with addiction and she also sees the broader problem. And so it's a paddle. Uh, it's part of protecting the Mississippi right where they would drill. And then, but it, it's also a big family friendly event on, on May 9th, Mother's Day uh, in Palisade, Minnesota. So that Facebook event, I just put in the chat. I'd love to meet you all there. If you have a watercraft or you want to borrow one, join us on the water and sort of start building the relationships and the, and the culture that helps us take these next steps and get over that mountain that Graham talked about. Um, yeah. So yeah, and thank you all for the invitation to be here. Really appreciate it. Appreciate this. But uh, Joe, we're sending out a <laughs> newsletter tomorrow we'll, on Friday. We'll include that link. So great, great, yeah, great presentation, yeah, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thank you thank so service. much. And I think we we've got to re recognize that uh, your presentation was more about the people in the place and the injustice that's happening right here in Minnesota. Uh, Graham's points about the addiction, our addiction to oil is one of the biggest problems we have to face, but the other thing is happening now and it's happening here. So thank you both. Yeah.